Hi friends, my name is Benjamin, and today I want to tell you another chilling story. On April 26, 2013, a Friday, Jessica Hiringa, a 26-year-old woman, was working the late shift at the Exxon gas station located in Norton Shores, Michigan, United States. Jessica, a devoted mother to her three-year-old son, took on any shift available as she was determined to provide for her child, especially since her boyfriend, Dakota Quail Dyer, had recently lost his job. Despite ongoing arguments between Jessica and Dakota, she remained steadfast in her commitment to giving her son the best life possible. The 26th of April started like any other day for Jessica. She purchased groceries at 2.44 p.m. before her scheduled shift, and by 4.35 p.m., she was at the gas station, ready to begin her workday. At 11.14 p.m. that night, a customer at the gas station made a 911 call. I don't know if this is an emergency. There is nobody here. It wouldn't allow me to pump gas. I went inside and there is nobody here. There's a car here. There is another car out front. It's very suspicious why there is nobody here. The customer told the 911 operator that the gas station was open. It wasn't locked at all and the lights were on, yet there was nobody inside or outside. Police went to the gas station to take a look around, and they called the owner to let him know that the gas station was left open. The police investigation revealed several intriguing clues surrounding Jessica's disappearance. Her car remained parked outside the gas station, while her purse, containing over $400, along with her keys and jacket, were found inside the establishment. Remarkably, the money from the gas station's register remained untouched. Other than Jessica, nothing else appeared to be missing. It appeared that Jessica was in the process of closing up and finishing her shift when she vanished. Inside the store, there were no signs of a struggle. Upon inspecting the back door and its immediate surroundings, the police made a startling discovery. Traces of blood outside and a battery cover from a laser sight for a Walther P-22 pistol, along with two watch batteries. Examining the receipts, the police noted that the last customer receipt was time-stamped at 10.52 p.m. Concerned about Jessica's absence, the owner of the store reached out to the store manager, who lived nearby, to inquire if she could assist in closing the store. The investigation into Jessica Hiringa's disappearance took a significant turn with the statements from her friend and the store manager. According to Jessica's friend, she had been at the store with Jessica from approximately 7.40 p.m. that night, staying for over an hour before leaving around 8.50 p.m. In contrast, the last known customer who interacted with Jessica reported that the gas station was empty, with Jessica being the sole person inside, and there was no one else in the store or the parking lot during her visit. The store manager, arriving later to lock up, provided a crucial eyewitness account. She mentioned being out with her husband around 11 p.m., riding their motorcycles eastbound on Sternberg Road. While passing the Exxon station, she observed a silver minivan entering the North Drive from the service drive of the Point Mall. The van proceeded to drive behind the gas station, turned off its headlights, and pulled up behind the store. At that time, Jessica's car was the only other vehicle in the parking lot. The store manager saw a figure at the back of the van, opening and closing the rear hatch before moving to the driver's door, entering the van, and driving westbound on the service drive. This account became a crucial piece of information for the investigation into Jessica Hearinga's mysterious disappearance. During the time the van was there, the manager did not see Jessica and did not hear anything that indicated distress or a struggle. She saw the driver of the van. He was a male wearing a red or orange sweatshirt. Her husband did not get a clear view of him, but thought he had crazy or wavy hair. Her husband believed the van was a Chrysler town and country van, silver in color. The police investigation into Jessica Hearinga's disappearance expanded as they obtained surveillance footage from a store in the Points Mall, revealing critical details. Despite the lack of cameras at the gas station, footage from the neighboring area proved to be pivotal. At 11.02 p.m., the footage captured a silver minivan turning northbound onto Grand Haven Road. 
Subsequently, footage from the Homestead Tavern showed the same van traveling northbound on Grand Haven Road just one minute later. Christian Van Antwerpen worked in a store right next to the gas station, and he told police that he saw a man in a minivan talking to Jessica. He said, It just seemed to me that this was just another guy hitting on her, or whatever, because she was an attractive girl. It was just an afterthought I almost didn't think about mentioning, but I thought it was my responsibility to say something about it. Christian recalled witnessing an interaction between Jessica and a man at the gas pump as she prepared to close the station. According to Christian, the man appeared flirtatious and questioned why Jessica was outside instead of inside the station. Both Christian and the Exxon manager provided the police with a description of the man they saw in the minivan. Based on their accounts, the police released a composite sketch of the minivan driver, describing him as a white male, approximately six feet tall, with a medium to heavy build. In the course of their investigation, the police spoke with Jeffrey Willis, a local resident who owned a silver minivan in connection with Jessica's disappearance. Willis granted permission for his van to be searched, but nothing connected to Jessica was found inside. However, police noted that the van appeared to have been recently cleaned. Willis informed the police that he had been at home until 12.30 a.m. that night. Despite extensive searches in the area, there was no trace of Jessica, and the case eventually went cold, leaving investigators with unanswered questions and no definitive leads. In 2016, a disturbing incident occurred involving a silver minivan attempting to abduct a teenage girl. The girl, on her way home from a party, was approached by the driver of the minivan, who offered her a lift home. Sensing danger, she requested to use the driver's phone instead. However, once inside the van, the driver locked the doors and informed her that the phone's battery was dead. To her horror, he then brandished a gun. As the situation escalated, the girl struggled to breathe and pleaded with the driver to open a window. Seizing the opportunity, she bravely jumped out of the moving van, managing to escape her captor's clutches. Remarkably, the teenager identified the driver of the silver minivan as Jeffrey Willis. Upon searching Jeffrey's van, law enforcement discovered a stolen Walther P-22 pistol, its serial number deliberately obscured. Through meticulous efforts, the police managed to restore the obscured number, leading them to trace the firearm back to its rightful owner. Astonishingly, the owner turned out to be one of Jeffrey's co-workers, who reported the gun missing from her residence. Adding to the perplexity, she noted that the gun had a laser sight, yet when recovered by authorities, the laser sight was notably absent. The comprehensive search of Jeffrey's van, residence, and electronic devices provided compelling evidence suggesting that Jeffrey not only attempted to abduct a teenager, but also played a role in the murder of Rebecca Bletch and the disappearance and subsequent murder of Jessica Hearinga. Consequently, Jeffrey faced charges of murder. During Jessica's murder trial, the prosecution put forward the argument that Jeffrey was a familiar patron at the Exxon gas station where Jessica was employed. They highlighted that Jeffrey had inherited a rundown property, 3,038 Bailey, following his grandfather's passing, conveniently located just 12 or 13 minutes away from the gas station. On the night Jessica vanished, April 26th, Jeffrey was reportedly present at a card game near the gas station having driven there in his silver minivan. Phone records indicated his presence in the vicinity of the Bailey property around 11.23 p.m. that same night. Subsequent police searches of the padlocked Bailey property uncovered cleaning supplies, including bleach. Testimonies from Jeffrey's co-workers further supported the prosecution's case, as they recounted observing deep scratches on Jeffrey's face and arms when he returned to work after that fateful night. Additionally, a witness who spotted a man matching Jeffrey's description in the minivan on the night of Jessica's disappearance noted blonde streaks in the individual's hair, a characteristic frequently associated with Jeffrey's hair highlighting habits. The prosecution contended that Jeffrey had been surveilling Jessica for a period leading up to the incident. They alleged that on that particular night, he maneuvered his vehicle to the rear of the gas station and coerced Jessica to enter his minivan, 
potentially using threats or physical force, as evidenced by the discovery of her blood outside the back entrance. Prosecutors posited that Jeffrey abducted Jessica from the gas station and subsequently killed her within a time frame of 24 to 48 hours. They argued that his motive was likely centered around engaging in criminal sexual activity. Testimony from Brenda Nestor, a regular patron at the Exxon gas station, was presented. She recounted encountering Jessica with Jeffrey the night prior to her disappearance and expressed concern for Jessica's safety, advising her against being alone at such late hours. In response, Jeffrey remarked to Brenda, She's got her customers looking out for her too. Brenda recounted observing Jessica's reaction to Jeffrey's presence, noting that Jessica appeared to shake her head and start shivering, as if a chill had suddenly overcome her. Brenda sensed that Jessica was not her usual cheerful self that night, prompting her to linger in the parking lot until closing time. From her vantage point, she witnessed Jeffrey departing the premises. The prosecution argued that Jeffrey returned the following night and abducted Jessica, building their case around this sequence of events. In their effort to bolster their case, the prosecution presented a pattern in Jeffrey's behavior regarding women, emphasizing his alleged propensity for abduction. They recounted an incident involving the attempted abduction of a teenage girl and highlighted the case of Rebecca Bletch, a 36-year-old woman found deceased on a road near her residence. Rebecca had suffered a fatal gunshot wound. She was discovered with her shirt slightly raised and her bottoms partially lowered, suggesting a possible struggle. The prosecution posited that Jeffrey had intended to abduct Rebecca at gunpoint, intending to take her to the abandoned Bailey property, where he would sexually assault and ultimately kill her. However, they contended that Rebecca resisted, prompting Jeffrey to shoot her. Evidence linking Rebecca's DNA to Jeffrey's glove was presented. Additionally, the prosecution asserted that Jeffrey employed the Walther P. 22 pistol to perpetrate the crime. These details were presented to the jury as part of the prosecution's argument. Police discovered compelling evidence linking Jeffrey to Rebecca Bletch's murder, including her DNA found on gloves and a vibrator inside a locked toolbox, as well as on handcuffs within a locked lockbox, all recovered from Jeffrey's van. Furthermore, the Walther P-22 pistol used in Rebecca's murder was found in the same lockbox. Jeffrey's DNA was also present on these items. Prosecutors characterized these items as Jeffrey's rape kit, as they contained various tools and implements commonly associated with sexual assault, including handcuffs, rope, restraints, chains, intim toys, a gag, lubricating jelly, insulin, syringes, gloves, Viagra, cameras, and bullets. In the trial related to Rebecca's case, Jeffrey was found guilty of first-degree murder and possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony. He received a life sentence in prison, along with an additional two years for the felony firearm charge. Although no DNA evidence was directly tied to Jessica Hiringa, the prosecution asserted that they possessed abundant evidence implicating Jeffrey in her disappearance and presumed murder. They emphasized that DNA evidence was not necessary given the substantial array of other incriminating evidence against him. Forensic examination of Jeffrey's electronic devices uncovered disturbing evidence suggesting his involvement in the disappearances and potential murders of Jessica Hiringa and Rebecca Bletch. Specifically, investigators found folders on his computer labeled VIX, along with two folders bearing the initials of Jessica and Rebecca. Police concluded that these initials corresponded to the victims, with accompanying dates believed to indicate the days of their respective disappearances or deaths. Notably, the date beside Jessica's initials coincided with the day after she went missing. The folder labeled JLH, Jessica's initials, contained photographs of Jessica, including her missing poster, along with a saved news article detailing her disappearance. Further examination revealed that Jeffrey's password for many accounts incorporated Jessica's initials and the date following her disappearance. In addition to this chilling evidence, investigators uncovered a vast collection of thousands of pornographic images and videos depicting the abduction, restraint, rape, and murder of women, 
with some materials featuring items consistent with those used in the images and videos, such as restraints and gags. Moreover, Jeffrey possessed several homemade voyeuristic videos depicting young girls and women swimming or in their homes, filmed without their knowledge. These videos served as alarming indications of Jeffrey's predatory behavior and disregard for the privacy and safety of others. The defense staunchly asserted Jeffrey's innocence, challenging the prosecution's case on multiple grounds. They argued that mere ownership of a silver minivan did not conclusively link Jeffrey to the vehicle seen in the gas station footage, especially considering the absence of a recorded license plate number. Additionally, they scrutinized Brenda's testimony, questioning the timing of her revelation regarding Jeffrey's presence at the gas station the night before Jessica's disappearance, which only surfaced three years later. The defense also cast doubt on the credibility of Jessica's boyfriend, Dakota Quayle Dyer, highlighting the tumultuous nature of their relationship and the existence of frequent arguments. Dakota's disclosure regarding Jessica's alleged heroin use raised suspicions, leading the defense to speculate about potential connections between Jessica's disappearance and involvement in drug-related activities. The verdict delivered by the jury was unanimous. Jeffrey was found guilty of the kidnapping and murder of Jessica Haringa. As a result, he was sentenced to spend the remainder of his life behind bars without any chance of parole. Jeffrey's cousin, Kevin Bloom, played a significant role in the aftermath of Jessica's disappearance. Initially, Kevin pleaded guilty to lying to detectives during the investigation. However, he later changed his plea to no contest, acknowledging his involvement as an accessory after the fact. Kevin admitted to assisting Jeffrey in disposing of Jessica's body after witnessing her with Jeffrey. According to Kevin's testimony, Jessica had sustained a head injury, was bound, naked, and motionless. He detailed how Jeffrey had been monitoring Jessica for some time and had assaulted her before transporting her body to a remote location. Kevin recounted a harrowing ordeal involving sexual assault, the use of intim toys, and torture inflicted upon Jessica by Jeffrey. Ultimately, they both drove to Sheridan Road near Laketon Road, where Jeffrey had already prepared a burial site. Following the legal proceedings, Jeffrey received a sentence of time served plus five years of probation. However, Jessica's body remains missing, leaving her family without closure. In the aftermath of Jessica's disappearance, her parents advocated for legislative action by proposing the Jessica Hiringa Act, also known as Jessica's Law. This bill aimed to mandate gas stations and convenience stores operating between 11 p.m. and 5 a.m. to either install and maintain security camera systems or have two employees present during these shifts. Despite their efforts, the bill has not yet been signed into law. In 2018, a bill was passed in the Michigan House of Representatives that will require convicted defendants to listen to victim impact statements. The bill was required due to the actions of Jeffrey in relation to Rebecca's case. When he was convicted of her murder, he refused to listen to the statements. It was signed into law that same year and is known as the Rebecca Bletch Law. What do you think of today's story? Write your opinion about this case in the comments. I thank you for your attention and recommend subscribing to the channel, as well as clicking on the bell to not miss new videos that are released daily. Take care of yourself and your loved ones. See you soon.